All right, this defeating Adventism is going to start tackling the chronology, the false chronology of Adventism. And there's no better place to start than 457 BC. I did mention this in Defeating Adventism number 35, where I kind of briefly touched on this. That video is a very long video, I think 56 minutes. This video here is probably going to be a little longer than normal, but it's going to highly focus on 457 BC. Now, this is going to really address the Adventist claim, this video here on Daniel 925. Of course, Adventists cite both Daniel 9.25 and Ezra 7.7. This video is going to focus on 9, Daniel 9.25. The video immediately following this is going to tackle Ezra 7.7. 7. Adventists tie these two together artificially. Adventists are prone. Uh, I, oh, they always do this. They cite a Bible verse and ignore the Bible passage. As they do here, and they're, they're doing so at their own detriment, which you are going to see as this video unfolds. We're not going to do what the Adventists do. We're going to examine the whole Bible passage. You cannot understand Daniel 9.25 isolated without understanding Daniel 9, 1 through 27. We're going to go through the entire chapter of Daniel, albeit brief in the beginning parts of it, but we're going to focus on the last part, Daniel's 9, uh, 24 through 27. There was a scholar... Um, quite unusual to have a female scholar, and one not to be liberal, but actually to be conservative and a good female scholar, which is Joyce Baldwin here that I'm, that I'm holding up. And I like what she said in her uh, section here on, on Daniel chapter 9, and she says the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9 are the most difficult verses in the entire uh, chapter uh, entire uh, you know in, entire chapter 9 of Daniel she says this all one can do is continue to apply a greek criteria as consistently as possible weigh careful the conclusions of others and make suggestions as the most likely uh, to a difficult solution and you know what she's entirely right this is difficult and you know what she means by this when she's saying this nobody has the answer definite article the for Daniel 9. Um, and unless you're one of these non-Christians, and I'm surrounded by non-Christians here. I got Jehovah Witnesses, I got Christadelphians, I got seven, uh, Jehovah Witnesses are there, that is, and Seventh-day Adventists are also over here. Unless you're one of those groups and you have to interpret Daniel 9 in a particular way so you can do some some Bible figuring, some Bible math, the waza waza bing, and we got 1844. Um, Unless you're a non-Christian group like that, I mean, that's what you do. You say you have the true answer. Nobody has, has, has a true answer. Now, in the scholars and all the scholars that, that, that I research, there are some points of agreement and there are some points of disagreement and the disagreement results from there is recognize ambiguity. That's what true scholars do. They recognize ambiguity. Modern archaeology continues to shed light on Daniel 9, as you're going to see in the Ezra uh, 7 7 video following this only the biblically proud and biblically ignorant are going to say we arrived at the answer for for daniel chapter 9 24 to 27 uh, it's just it's crazy the adventist chronology is going to fall starting right here right now at this first point at 457 BC. Let's start by looking at the chart from the Adventist prophet Ellen White in her Great Controversy book. And here's the Great Controversy that I use all the time, the 1888 edition. And look at this here. So this is where it starts and you see Daniel 9.25 and Ezra 7.7 cited in the prophet Ellen White. But I, I just wanna ask you this, why does the Adventist chronology start with 457 BC? There's many previous ver uh, verses in the Bible that are prophetic about Christ such as Genesis 3.15. Why do they start here at 457 B.C.? And then they assign some arbitrary letter from a Persian king as relating to it too. That's Ezra 7.7. 7. Uh, when, when the Bible doesn't even tell us to do that. Well, guess what? We know why. This is just leftover junk from the false prophet William Miller who used essentially the same chronology saying Christ was going to come visibly in 1843, 1844, and it didn't happen, but the Adventists kept it. That's where it came from. So this starting point of 457 BC, not supported in the scriptures. Look with me here. Adventists link Ezra 7-7 and Daniel 9-25 completely artificially, but 
As for 7-7, as I said, it's going to be addressed in the next video. We're going to continue here with Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at some Review and Herald magazines that talk about Daniel 9.25 and what Adventists say Daniel says. Again, we're going to be good Bereans. Adventists are not good Bereans. They don't test the scriptures. We're, we're going to be good Bereans. Let's look here. October 14, 1976, page 6. We're going to look at that little paragraph there on the bottom of the page. And it's blown up and it says what? The decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 9.25, did not go into effect until the fall of 457 B.C. Look, look at that sentence again. Notice how it appears in this sentence as though Daniel 9.25 supports a decree for 457 B.C. Daniel 9.25 has no 457 date in it. Daniel 9.25 mentions a decree, but it's impossible to determine the date of that decree. Go on to the next magazine, Youth Instructor, February 1886. See, Adventists are using the scriptures wrong. Let's, let's see what they do here. Just read the purple text with me here. It says, But the commandment mentioned in Daniel 9.25 includes the building not only of the temple, but of the city. Oh, it does. Daniel 9.25 includes the rebuilding of the temple and the city. Okay. Let's look at Daniel 9.25. There's Daniel 9.25. And where does Daniel, Daniel 9.25 say the rebuilding of the temple? I see rebuilding, I see building Jerusalem, but I don't see the temple. This is now the second time in two magazines where we've seen the Seventh-day Adventists misquote Daniel 9.25. First one said, what, it has 457 BC in it, and it doesn't. This last one here, the youth instructor, says but it has the decree to build the city and the temple, and you just looked at it, and it doesn't. Adventists quit abusing the scriptures. I've already done it twice in front of us. Let's look at the next one. Keep reading with me here in yellow. And it says, at length, this is what I want you to focus on. In other words, all three decrees from the three Persian kings are necessary to rebuild Jerusalem. And that's essentially what they say. You can look at the green text on the bottom. It, it says, this proves that it took all three decrees from the three Persian kings to constitute the one commandment of God, and that is to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, three. Here we are at a Sabbath school quarterly, 1967. We're going to look on page 16 at this paragraph, which says in the yellow text, I like this, the decree of Cyrus was issued at most only a few months later than the uh, episode of chapter 9, okay? But because of the dilatory conduct of the return exiles, oh no, the exiles, they're just lazy. Um, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. It says what? A second decree, that of Darius, became necessary. And then even a third decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC. And then you can go to the blue text at the bottom. For this reason, we take the third decree of Artaxerxes as the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Note again, all three decrees are necessary. Adult Sabbath School Lessons, 1994, page 38. What do they say here? The beginning of the 490 years and the 2300 and Daniel 9.25. Ezra 6.14, it says, indicates that God's command for the complete restoration of Jerusalem was put into effect by the decrees of three Persian monarchs. There it is again, three decrees. Here's our last magazine we're going to look at from 2002. What do they say here on page 43? Yellow text. Read carefully now. Ezra mentions a Persian decree by Cyrus in 537 to build, to rebuild the temple, Ezra 1.4, which, which was affirmed by Darius in 520. Green text. However, that specific decree, issued twice with the same decree, that specific decree does not refer to the one mentioned in Daniel 9.25. Hey, they're changing on us here. It says, because according to Gabriel's words, the decree involved the rebuilding of the city, not just the temple. Pink text. Another decree was issued by Artaxerxes in 457, authorized the restoration of Jerusalem. And we got Ezra cited again. No longer is it necessary to have three decrees. Well, uh, since 2002, anyway. So, you know, failure point number one, Seventh-day Adventist, you can't even teach your own consistent chronology. You teach three decrees are needed, three decrees are needed, three decrees are needed. Oh, 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 not now, just one, because the first two really don't talk about building a city. It's about a temple. Well, they're right. It is about building a temple. It's not about building a city on those decrees. But they can't even get their own chronology right. Now, as I said, we cannot isolate Daniel 9.25 from the entire chapter of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, and you see it on the screen here in front of you, 1 to 27, is divided into three sections. We've got an opening prayer of Daniel. We've got the angelic interruption for a few verses. 
and the 70 week prophecy. I'm going to go over the opening prayer of Daniel very briefly, first, just the first two verses. Then we're going to briefly talk about the angelic interruption. I'm going to spend most of our time in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, because that is really, that's the prophetic uh, verses of the book of Daniel. So now let's look here at Daniel 9, 1 through 19. Only, like I said, only in the first two verses. So in here, Daniel was a lad about 15 years old, young man, at the capture of Jerusalem about, you know, the 605 BC mark. He is now in his 80s. And he perceives, as you see in verse 2, in the books, that's at least Jeremiah in the books, and probably others that you're going to see, that the time is almost up. He knows the 70 years is almost up. Not only in Jeremiah, but he's also thinking, and look with me here, Second Chronicles 36, 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah 25, until the land had enjoined its Sabbath, all the days that it lay desolate, it kept the Sabbath, to fulfill the 70 years. The nation of Israel was disobeying the commands of God and God punishes them, them for that. And one of those things that they were disobeying was they weren't following the command to let the land have its Sabbath rest. As Leviticus 25 will show us here what that says. Leviticus 25, look at verse 2, tell the Israelites that when they enter the land, we're about to give them they're to observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you can plant your fields. And for six years you can prune your vineyard and, and gather its produce. But the seventh year is to be a Sabbath rest for the land. The nation of Israel was prone to rebel against the Lord. And that's the whole blessings and curses of the covenant of, that God had, Yahweh God, with the nation of Israel. Blessings should you obey, curses if you don't. They didn't. They got captured by Nebuchadnezzar for 70 years for not obeying God. Let's look here at Daniel 1 again, first two verses. This first year of Darius, you see here in 9.1, it's about 538 BC. So the scriptures that he's referring to is likely the books of Jeremiah. And Jan Daniel realizes the 70 years is almost complete. But he's really this is something that some scholars say he really may have not been exactly sure when to start counting the 70 years. Do I count the 70 years? At the time when I was captured with Jerusalem, about the 60, you know, 605 BC mark, or is it the second phase of captivity, about the 597 mark, or even the third phase of the captivity at the 586 mark? Scholars don't know, and and they, they, Daniel may not even have even known when to start it. But there's this. Look with me here. That from about 530, uh, 538 to 605 BC was about 67 years. So it's reasoned by a lot of the scholars that one, because you're going to see here in a minute, Daniel 9.23, Daniel is beloved of God. What a compliment. I think the apostle uh, John is the only other one I think that gets such a high compliment also. That God relented to a degree and let Daniel um, or, and let his prayer be answered in about the 67th year. Now, let's look at Daniel 9, 20 to 23. In the middle of Daniel's prayer, the angel Gabriel comes and interrupts him. Look at 9, 21. This is the man. Gabriel appears in the form of a man, which was quite unusual, I, I think. This is the same Gabriel who, in, in 9, 26, who's talking to Daniel, is going to give him a prophecy um, of the future coming Messiah. And it just so happens, this is the same Gabriel who is going to again announce the, the coming of the Messiah uh, in Luke 126, hundreds of years later. It appears the uh, angel Gabriel is, a, is an angel with a distinct mission, and that is to announce Messiah. So Daniel is described, you can see here in 923, beloved of, of God. Now the angel here tells him, Listen carefully to this vision. You see it here on the screen in front of you. The, and, and as you, you do this, I want you to keep this in mind. The 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah, far more complicated than any reading and understanding of uh, Jeremiah 25, 1 through 14 would yield, as you're going to see here in the verses following this. This is far more complicated than just saying, oh, let's just count 70 years and that's the end. No, it's not. It has a much deeper meaning. Let's look here at Daniel 9.24. 
Here's the, here's the context. Here's where we're going to spend most of our time, 924 to 927. If you believe, you understand the 70 years of captivity is prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 25, 1 through 14 as the 70 years and that's it, you are sorely mistaken because what you have before you is, remember what the angel Gabriel said, listen carefully to this vision. Likewise, if you believe you have the, air quotes, one true answer, there is no scholarly consensus with 100% agreement on the interpretation of each aspect of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. But let me say this, no Protestant scholar, and I've got, I don't know, 15, 18 of them, no one has the understanding of Daniel that the Seventh-day Adventists have. Absolutely nobody. The Seventh-day Adventist interpretation stands alone and on the outside of Protestant interpretations. Protestant scholars recognize that there's points of ambiguity and they recognize that there's points of agreement. Recognizing ambiguity, I want to say, is honest. And, and because, and you're going to see here in a minute where the, where the ambiguity lies. Not recognizing ambiguity is pride and arrogance, which is what I see in Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah Witnesses, Christadelphians, etc. The, the SDA interpretation of Daniel does not allow for any ambiguity. They approach this like they know it. We understand it all. Now, they never tell you how they get there, but they just say that they do. The SDA interpretation is going to be shown to be completely incorrect. We may agree on just one or two points, but the bigger, larger points of it, incorrect. So I want you to look here. You have to understand in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that the, the 70 weeks are broken up into three segments. You can see underlined here in 925, you got the seven weeks, followed by the 62 weeks, and then in 927, you have the one week, three segments. I want you to notice the time plan. The seven weeks and the 62 weeks are consecutive. Look what it says. There shall be seven weeks, then for 62 weeks. It's like that follows the seven weeks, I'm sorry, the 62 weeks immediately follow the seven weeks. But look at 926. And it says, and after the 62 weeks, then it shows us some events are going to happen. Here's, what the, here's the ambiguity. Here's what the scriptures do not tell us. Look at, you look at Daniel 926. Then after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince are going to come and they're going to destroy Jerusalem again. It doesn't tell us how long after this. A day? A week? A month? A year? It just doesn't tell us. These are not consecutive time periods. Now there's a couple major schools of thought out here on, on how to interpret Daniel. And, and, and this one that you're, you're going to see here in a minute on the screen comes from uh, this scholar here. His name is Stephen Miller. And he, he largely says the interpretation of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 depends on your view. Are you an amillennial, which means there's no 1,000 year reign in Christ, or are you a millennial, which means you believe there's a 1,000 year reign in Christ? So look with me here. Amillennials, no actual 1,000 year reign in Christ. They believe the whole 70 week uh, prophecy here in 924 ended in 164 BC. That's the Maccabean revolt, by the way. Most of your premillennials uh, they, they, well, of course, they're premillennial because they believe there will be an actual 1,000 year reign of Christ. And the weeks and the seven and the 62 are, conse are consecutive and they are now complete. But there's a gap between the 69th and the 70th week and the 70th week has not occurred yet. No Protestant, by the way, links this prophecy of Daniel in, in, in the word of God to any chronology where they add another another group of Bible verses and its years and converting days and years and years and days and waza waza bing, we wind up in 1844. Nobody does that. Nobody. Adventists stand alone in, in that realm. No Protestant believes Christ was crucified in AD 31. Sorry, you can't have Passover in AD 31. Discuss that in defeating uh, Adventism number 35 on Hanukkah. So the, Advent, the Adventist interpretation of Daniel is, well, it's Adventist. And what I mean by that, it, it's not Christian. It's Adventist, which means it's non-Christian by definition. The Adventist interpretation of Daniel 9, as I'm looking at it, and, 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 I, and I got my mind around it, it's an odd, weird mixture of premillennial, millennial, and then, you know, Adventist chronology kind of all mashed together to try to make something cogent, when it's not. It's just absolutely unreadable. 
All right, look with me here. Actually, right here. I'm going to uh, quote from this book. Now, I mentioned her earlier, Joyce Baldwin, gives another view. Instead of amillennial, premillennial, she says, we're going to look at it in like a historical setting. So look with me on screen. Look what she says. She goes, we can understand the interpretation of Daniel through these five uh, perspectives. We have a, a, a historical perspective of Daniel, interpretation from Qumran, in other words, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, which really do impact, as you're going to see in the next video, interpretation of Daniel 9. Uh, interpretation in the New Testament era, vice and interpretation in the early Jewish and Christian, and present day interpretations. But you know what I want you to know most about the present day interpretations? They don't include the seven day Adventism. A seven day Adventism is just ignored because it's not taken seriously. Because everybody knows it's, well, it's seven day Adventist, and that means by definition it's not Christian. Failure number two. Seventh-day Adventism interpretation of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, completely outside the bounds of Protestant Christianity, which means Seventh-day Adventists, you're not Protestants. You are Seventh-day Adventists. You are not Protestant Christians. You are not Christians. All right, look with me here at the next slide. Daniel 9, 24. It's a key slide. Here's a point of agreement, I think we can say, between Seventh-day Adventists and and Protestants is that the 70 weeks are 490 years. Okay, that's a point of agreement. But I want you to note this prophecy. Look at it here. It says, this prophecy is what? About your people and your city. That's the nation of Israel. This prophecy concerns the nation of Israel. Not Gentiles, the nation of Israel. Adventist error in applying this prophecy when it says in the very beginning, this prophecy is for your people and your city. That's the Jews. That's not Gentiles. At Venice, you know what? You're neither Jewish and you, and you have no prophetic relationship to the city of Jerusalem. So, you know what? You've already, Daniel 9 does not apply to you. And you're actually trying to co-opt it and throw it into some mathematical chronology scheme is wrong and in error. But you know, at Venice, so you're, you're trying to associate yourself with Jerusalem. It's funny. Because on one hand, Ellen White was trying to distance Adventist from Jerusalem. Look with me here. Here she is in early writings in 1882. Look at the yellow text. Then I was pointed. Who? By, by who, right? Um, some would say by God. I would say um, by her, um, uh, her satanic uh, uh, guide. Uh, then I was pointed to some who are in great error, believing that their uh, duty is to go to old Jerusalem. Read the green text. For those who think that they are yet to go to Jerusalem will have their minds there. Now, read this next part of the sentence carefully. And their means will be withheld from the cause of present truth to get themselves and others there. You know what? It's all about the money. That's what the means, the means is the money. Ellen White wanted control of the money in America, not going to Jerusalem and proselytizing Jews. So read the blue text, and it says what? It would take a long while to make very few of the Jews believe, even in the first advent of Christ. And then she says, you know, don't even bother going because I saw that old Jerusalem would never be built up. Here's Ellen White talking down Jerusalem, but here's Adventists in Daniel 9, 9.24 trying to apply a prophecy about Jerusalem to them. So what is it, Adventists? Uh, stay out of Jerusalem, you really don't like it, you talk it down, at least your prophet did, but yet here you are taking a prophecy and trying to apply it to yourself about Jerusalem. Just crazy nonsense of Adventism. Adventist failure number three, this prophecy concerns the nation of Israel and Jerusalem. Adventist, you are neither Jewish nor do you have a prophetic relationship to the city of Jerusalem. You have no business applying this totally Jewish prophecy to your Gentile chronology. Let's continue in Daniel 9.24. This is a key point here I want, I want you to see. The 70 weeks and its fulfillment consist of these six items you see in front of you. All six of these must be fulfilled to complete the 70 weeks or the 490 years. This is why you can't separate Daniel 9.25 from Daniel 9.24. We have to complete these six things. And these six things are grouped like this. Generally speaking, the first three have to do with sin, and the next three have to do with you know, after sin is dealt with to a uh, one degree or another. Let's look at some of these. First, this first grouping of three. Remember, all six of these have to be complete 
when well, when let me say it like this when all six of these are complete the 490 years is over that's it we're done so these first three look at them finish uh, transgression put an end to sin atone for iniquity well you know what there is pretty darn near unanimous agreement that point number three on the screen in front of you to atone for iniquity that's what christ did on the cross there is not unanimous agreement on no, what numbers points uh, one and two mean and see here we go again with the ambiguity so look with me here look at point um, uh, number one there are differing opinions as to the end of sin finishing transgression there's a sense that to finish and end sin well that was accomplished by christ on the cross there's also a sense that the atonement provided the means for sin but the total elimination of sin which point two kind of in uh, in in tones put in point two and into sin well that's a future event so scholars disagree whether these points one and two have been fulfilled or whether they are going to be fulfilled later some scholars will say put an end to sin we can't put an end to sin until until christ comes the second time for his church and there will be no more sin and we will be taken up with him um so see that's where the ambiguity of this lies and that's where honesty comes in to it so there's some scholars that say um yeah some of these are uh, are are mean this and some of them say well this means that um but yet we really can't say for certainty which group is right Let's look at this next one. Bring everlasting righteousness. Here's a couple of views. Righteousness has not been brought to the earth because, well, we are not righteous yet. So they're saying, well, that's a future event. Point two in the yellow box. Righteousness has come through Christ, but it's only to those who have, who have taken his offer of salvation. Again, you see the points of ambiguity and why it's foolishness to say you have the right answer. Let's look at point number five. To seal both prophet and vision. Here's the two views. This is a final fulfillment of all revelation, which means no revelation is needed. It's the end of time. The 490 years are complete. They're going to seal up prophet and vision. We don't need any more prophets and visions because the 490 years has ended with the second coming of Christ. Point number two. There are those that think, well, no, no, it's not that. It's the end of the Old Testament prophets receiving visions and prophets. So let's go with me here. Let's remind ourselves, the Adventist chronology does what? It ends in AD 34. Remember, the end of the 490 years completes what? All six of those items. And one of those items is visions and prophecy. Look at this chart here. All visions and prophecies will com be completed either when? At the end of the Old Testament period or at the end of the 490 year prophecy. Well, when does the Adventist 490 years end? In AD 34. Huh. You know what that means? There is no more visions and prophecies after AD 34. This chronology of Adventism has just been refuted by Daniel 9.24 to seal up prophets and visions at the end of the 490 years because, well, the Adventist already ended the 490 years in AD 34, which means... Every vision and prophet, prophecy by Ellen White has been rendered void uh, since AD 34. Um, failure 4, upon completion of all six items in Daniel 9.24, remember what I said, the 70 weeks are complete. The Adventists believe the 70 weeks ended. So in other words, all six items are done in AD 34. This means visions and prophecies ceased in AD 34. Any vision after AD 34 is false and contrary to Daniel 9.24. The Adventist chronology of the 2300 days, you just did something for me. You just refuted your own prophet, Ellen White, who gave visions and prophecies after AD 34, when by definition of Daniel, she can't. Let's look here again on point six, to anoint a most holy place. Got a, three different views on this, that this is gonna be a future temple in heaven, and there's those that say, no, 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 there's no future temple in heaven. Just read Revelation 21, 22. Others say that, that this, and this, and, and point three, it seems to be the one that most scholars agree on. Uh, they agree on point number one. That's where most scholars agree. Point three is, is, is still a little odd because they say the anointing is not a building, but the person of Christ. Again, a ambiguity. You can't say you absolutely know with certainty every aspect of this. Some, yes. Others, no, no you can't. All right. Let's look at Daniel 9.25 briefly. 
This verse describes when the 70 week clock starts. And it starts with the word to restore Jerusalem. And what do we know about that? Look at it here. When the word, Debar, to, and you see that here in front of you, to restore and build Jerusalem when that starts. By the way, the KJV completely mistranslates this verse. They take the word, that the Hebrew word is Debar, and they translate it as commandment. And when the commandment to read, no, it's not a commandment, it's a Debar. See, the, the KJV translators were wrong here in Daniel 9.25. So the prophecy of Daniel, this is what we do know, was not in 457 B.C. The next video is going to address what, what happened there, and you'll see there is the, um, the thumbnail for that video. Now let's look at Daniel 9.26. And it says what? And after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. You know what? The scriptures do not tell us how long after those 62 weeks that these events you see on the screen in front of you occur. Where the anointed one's going to be cut off, and, and when the uh, prince, uh, when the people of the prince come and destroy the city and sanctuary, it doesn't tell us that a day, a week, a month, a year, etc. But here's what we do know: the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So we got the set, first seven weeks completed, the next 62 weeks completed, and it says, and after those weeks, the people of the prince are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. So note the text. It is the people of the prince that destroy Jerusalem and the sanctuary. The people, in this case, of the prince, it's Roman general Titus, who utterly destroyed city and sanctuary in A.D. 70. So with that said, Seventh-day Adventist failure number five, the people of the prince, the Romans, destroyed Jerusalem and the sanctuary. This occurred when? in AD 70. But when does the Adventist 490 year uh, chronology end? In AD 34. See, I, see, this is what happens when you read a Bible verse and ignore the Bible passages. Because um, in, in my math, um, AD 70, it's um, after AD 34. But we have the events of AD 70 occurring after the 62nd week, but before the last and final seventh week. Adventist chronology fails again for a fifth time. All right, we're almost done here. 927. This is where Adventists error the worst. Look at this. Look at the text here. And he shall make. We're talking again, still about the a people of a of a prince. And he shall make a strong a strong covenant. See, that's unusual. Strong covenant. Strong gabar covenant. That it's freely accepted, but done so under unfavorable conditions. Here's what I mean by that. The superior party in this case, is in a position of power and establishes the terms of the covenant. The lesser party has a free choice to accept or reject it, but they enter freely based on the terms of the superior. Now, Adventists make Daniel 9.27, they say it's Christ. You know what I say to the Adventist? The scriptures nowhere say Christ made a seven-year covenant. The scriptures nowhere say that Christ made a seven-year covenant and then broke it halfway through. Adventists make Christ a covenant breaker, a sinner, which is most abhorrent in Adventism. Adventists will say, see, it's the death of Christ on the cross that ended sacrifice. Because you see here in 927 about putting an end to sacrifice. Adventists, you have it wrong again. After Christ died on the cross, sacrifices continued. And you know when they continued until? A.D. 70, until the destruction of the temple. When the temple was destroyed, then there were no more sacrifices. But after Christ died on the cross in AD 33, there were still sacrifices occurring in the temple by, the, by those that were practicing uh, Judaism. So Adventists, you have that wrong too when you say that about Christ. Sacrifices, or Adventists, you know what? You make him a covenant breaker. You make Christ a sinner. You make Christ an antichrist, like Antiochus Epiphanes was in 164 BC. Because look at this, what it says. Look at 927. And, and it says, uh, and, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. That is another type of Antiochus Epiphanes, who went into the temple in the Maccabean revolt era and stopped the sacrifices. That's what that's referring to. That what happened in 164 BC is going to happen again. There's going to be another type of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Antichrist, is going to stop temple sacrifices. He's going to break his 
covenant. Then it says the end is poured out on the desolator. Christ is not a desolator, and you make him a desolator when you do that. And this is most horrible. Failure number six. No seven-year covenant has been made with the nation of Israel. That has yet to be broken halfway through, including an end of sacrifice and offerings in the temple. It hasn't happened yet. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has completely misapplied Daniel 9.25 because this is what happens when you ignore uh, a Bible passage and you focus on a Bible verse. They didn't read 924 to 27. They have no idea how 924 and those six items and their completion affects them and what Daniel 924 to 27 mean. Adventists do not understand the implications of those six items in Daniel 924. So in summary, six points of failure which proves that this Daniel 925 prophecy has absolutely, Adventists have applied it wrong. And so it it, it does not apply to their chronology because they even applied the verse wrong. They can't even do their own chronology right. We need three letters. We need three letters from three virgin kings. And then we get to 2002. Excuse me. No, we just need one letter. All right. No Protestant, by the way, uses an Adventist interpretation of Daniel 9. It is ignored. And in some cases, and I'll probably do a video on it, it's highlighted in their books on Daniel and criticized. The Adventist chronology ends in AD 34. But we saw Daniel 9.26 talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is A.D. 70, decades after the end of the Adventist prophecy. The Adventists can't even get the chronology right in Daniel 9.24-27. to The people of the prince destroyed the city. It's gross error in, in Daniel 9.27, as they do, because I read in your commentary, to say that that's Christ. That Christ's death on the cross ended sacrifice. No, it didn't. It ended Sacrifice ended when Jerusalem and the city were destroyed in AD 70. Christ did not make a, a, a covenant with people for seven years. Show me that scripture verse, by the way, in the comments. I like to read those, where Christ made his covenant for seven years, broke it halfway through, forbid sacrifices in the temple. All right. You, you, just, you just made Christ an anti-Christ, Seventh-day Adventist. You ought to be very um, concerned and very afraid for what you just did. And you made him an abomination of desolation. Just read 927 again and those points of failure. Last slide here. Look with me here. The Bible and the Word of God alone smashes this false Seventh-day Adventist chronology and 457 B.C. goes down like a house of cards.